Uh, thank you. Time is tight, so I'll move on. Next item of business is portfolio questions. And as usual, to get as many people in as possible, I'd like short, succinct questions, followed by short, succinct answers. Question one, Bruce Crawford. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government how the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 will change the way in which domestic abuse is tackled. Cabinet Secretary. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 creates a specific offence covering not only physical abuse but other forms of psychological abuse and controlling behaviour that were previously difficult to prosecute. The Act creates a course of conduct offence for the first time, making it easier for police and prosecutors to investigate and prosecute domestic abuse as a single offence, enabling physical, psychological and controlling behaviour by a partner or ex-partner to be prosecuted at once. It reflects the fact that children are harmed by domestic abuse by creating a statutory aggravator in relation to children and will enable the court for the first time to use a non-harassment order to protect children as well as the adult victim of the offence. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? <coughs> Excuse me. In preparation for changes in the legislation, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how much the Scottish Government has provided Police Scotland in order to support police officers understanding the dynamics of power and control in abusive relationships and to help them recognise the signs of coercive and controlling behaviour. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a really important point raised by uh, Bruce Crawford because, the, of course, legislation came into force, as he, know, as he knows and members will know at the beginning of the month. That was to allow that training to have to take place. Um, we gave, to directly answer this question, 825 thousand pounds of funding to Police Scotland. Uh, that was to support the development of training of 14,000 police officers and staff. Uh, police Scotland have also developed a self-completion e-learning package on the new legislation, which is made available to 22,000 staff. Um, as well as that, Lord President committed to ensuring all members of the judiciary receive training uh, on the Act, uh, and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have developed a package of training uh, for our prosecutors uh, as well. We've also provided 166,000 to Scottish Women's Aid to develop training around the new offence in the Domestic Abuse Act. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Daniel Johnson. In the response to the Justice Committee report on the Domestic Abuse Act, the Scottish Government accepted it's possible that the creation of new coercive controlling behaviour offence could lead to an increased cost for local authorities with regards to the increased demand for criminal justice social work services. Given the CGSW budget for the previous two years has remained static, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm the necessary funding to cope with the anticipated increase in costs will be made available to local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's important to note within that question that Margaret Mitchell uh, asked and a very uh, uh, important question that she asks, um, that of course we have ring-fenced uh, that budget uh, for local authorities. My uh, conversations with uh, COSLA and local authorities continue, uh, of course, on this matter, of course, also with any additional pressures they may face with the passing of the presumption against short sentences uh, as well, um, uh, for which we've made additional budgets available. So I'll continue those conversations. Um, I'm very aware of those budget pressures that may well exist, um, but uh, as I say, my conversations and engagement uh, with the local authorities are, are very constructive on this matter. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the issue of training is an important one with regard to domestic abuse and indeed in some jurisdictions specialist officers are trained to degree level. So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions he's held with Police Scotland and the SPA uh, regarding the possibility of higher level training indeed to degree level for specialist officers in this area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's not something that Police Scotland have raised uh, with me nor either the uh, number of organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid uh, that, that, that represent uh, women and female victims in particular uh, of domestic abuse. That, that's not been raised with me that there needs to be additional training than the funding, the training that we have uh, funded or indeed uh, the training that uh, Scottish Women's Aid have provided. But I'll certainly in my, my next conversations uh, with Police Scotland and indeed with the other organisations that represent victims of domestic abuse uh, raise that issue about further training and I'll take the conversation from there. Question two, Frank McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to support vulnerable witnesses before, during and after criminal court proceedings. Cabinet Secretary. The Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 introduced measures to support vulnerable witnesses and requires criminal justice agencies to set and monitor standards of service. The Vulnerable Witnesses Bill aims to improve how child and uh, eventually other, other vulnerable witnesses give evidence through the enhanced use of pre-recording. 
Uh, we're also providing £18 million pounds in 2019-20 to fund a range of services which victims and witnesses can access before, during and after criminal proceedings. The Victims Task Force, which I co-chair alongside the Lord Advocate, is considering additional actions to improve end-to-end -end support for victims and witnesses throughout the criminal justice process and beyond. Bolton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and I welcome the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill, uh, which recently passed through the, the Justice Committee. I have been contacted by constituents whose children were witnesses at court giving evidence in a crime where they were the victims. Although there was a successful conviction which was very welcome, the families feel support, especially in an emotional nature, was not provided to their children by the justice system or the local authority, particularly in the period following the conviction. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how children who are both victims and witnesses can be better supported emotionally and to better understand the court processes and the possible outcomes? And would he consider meeting with these families to hear firsthand about their experiences? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Fulton uh, McGregor for his question? Can I express uh, my sympathies to, 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 to those families, and particularly young people that had to go through that process? Uh, that would have been a traumatic experience, I don't doubt. Uh, from everything that uh, he is saying uh, and I know these things are not easy uh, at all and it's exactly the kind of questions and exactly the kind of issues that Lord Advocate and I are exploring uh, as the co-chairs of, of, of the Victims uh, Task Force. Uh, of course, the Victims and, and Witnesses uh, Bill is, is going through um, the, 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 the Parliament, or the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill is going through Parliament uh, currently, which he knows and of course uh, has an input in uh, as, as a member of the Justice Committee. That will make a big, big difference to children that in the future have to go through uh, a court uh, process. In terms of the specifics of the case, uh, I would ask that Fulton McGregor perhaps writes to me in the first instance with the detail of the case, uh, and from there I will judge whether it's appropriate as Justice Secretary for me uh, to meet. I have no fundamental objection, uh, but it may be those issues are perhaps in other uh, people's jurisdiction uh, or indeed uh, remit, but of course I will, I will uh, look at that uh, very favourably. I know you wish to be polite, Cabinet Secretary, but if you could face the microphone so that we can hear your answer. Question uh, three, Finlay Carson. This government, what its position is on the way in which the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010 has been implemented? Um, that's Minister. The Control of Dogs Act 2010 provides local authorities with powers to impose dog control notices where a dog is deemed to be out of control. And we are aware that some local authorities have imposed a considerable number of dog control notices, whilst others have not. But however, this may reflect the fact that some local authorities are choosing to make greater use of informal warnings to dog owners. As the member will know, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee is currently undertaking scrutiny of that Act, and we will con carefully consider the Committee's findings when that review is complete. Finley Carson. I thank the Minister for that response. It appears that because it's not government legislation that little has been done to promote it. It's claimed that even police officers don't know all about the, the control that was brought in almost a decade ago. Currently the laws on dangerous dogs and sheep worrying is fragmented between various acts and statutory instruments both devolved and at, and, and at UK level. Doesn't the Minister agree with me that we need an all-encompassing piece of legislation with clear powers outlined to ensure both enforcers and the public are clearly aware that their respective roles and responsibilities are in the control of dogs? The 2010 Act provides Act, please, the tools briefly. To, to consolidate that and uh, to cover uh, multiple members' bills. Thank you. Minister. Uh, the member raised a number of different points uh, there. I'll address the one about awareness. The Scottish Government is always um, uh, very keen to assist in awareness raising. Um, the dog control notice is obviously run by local authorities, but we'd be very happy to take part in, in further awareness raising work that might be helpful to communities on that. But in terms of the issue regarding livestock worrying, um, we are aware that there are concerns that dog control notices are not generally used for incidents of livestock worrying or livestock attack, as it's sometimes called. And this, as this is something uh, that the police, rather than the local authority officers, would normally deal with. Um, so I'm sure the member will be aware that Ms Harper's uh, bill proposal is currently out for public consultation and I would encourage people to respond and offer their views on those proposals. So segue to Emma Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. The Control of Dogs Act 2010 doesn't specifically refer to livestock worry or livestock attack. It uses the words apprehension, which is, that's why it's not strong enough. So does the minister actually then agree with me that we should encourage people to feed into the consultation so that we can get a better piece of legislation to better protect our farmers' livestock from attacks by out-of-control dogs? Minister, briefly, please. 
Uh, the Scottish Government does recognise the impact of dog attacks on livestock and we are committed to working with all our partners um, to tackle this. But I do agree with the member. Uh, I think all those who have an interest in this should have a look at the consultation that Emma Harper has put forward and contribute their views on how livestock can be better protected. Question five, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is given to breastfeeding mothers when attending court. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> this is an operational matter for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, SCTS fully embraced the responsibilities under the Breastfeeding Scotland Act 2005 by making facilities available within court buildings. Uh, breastfeeding within courtrooms themselves is also welcomed. Uh, more broadly, the member will be aware that the 2005 Act uh, makes it a criminal offence to try to stop or to prevent a woman from feeding a child under the age of two in any place in which the public has access and which the child under two is entitled to be. While legislation is in place to support public breastfeeding, we recognise that more needs to be done to address the negative cultural attitudes that can undermine this choice. Uh, last summer, we announced an, ad an additional £2 million investment for breastfeeding support. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. And as the author of that particular act, I'm well aware of its provisions. However, I do appreciate that there is policy to accommodate breastfeeding in courts, but I was recently made aware of the case of a breastfeeding mother who was cited as a witness and advised by the Fiscal's Office that she wouldn't be permitted to bring her baby to court. So, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that clearer, non-conflicting guidance and information must be provided to all breastfeeding mums having to attend court? And in the case of jury duty, if supporting breastfeeding mums is considered somehow impractical, then breastfeeding should be added to the list of excusals for jury duty. Cabinet Secretary. I can thank Elaine uh, Smith uh, for, for that question. Uh, obviously, I don't know the specific case she's referring to, but I might know actually which case it is uh, that, that, that she's referring to. But if she wants to chat to me offline about the very specific case, of course, um, I, I can see if I can help to address that or facilitate conversations with SCTS. Uh, what I would say is, is there are some complications uh, within the court, only that uh, in, in the public area of the court, of course, um, th th there, there must be uh, no bar uh, to, to a mother who wishes to breastfeed. Uh, conduct within the courtrooms themselves is the responsibility of the presiding judge uh, or sheriff. Uh, and um, For example, there's a statutory bar for children under the age of 14 um, being in the courtroom during a criminal trial except as witnesses or a party to proceedings. Um, and, and, and in addition, a judge will consider the interest in justice, uh, of justice uh, and the normal requirements uh, for ensuring proper conduct of proceedings, uh, which may not necessarily be conducive to a small child being within the court environment. Notwithstanding all of that, uh, I fully accept what Elaine Smith says that uh, uh, in cases particularly uh, for jurors, uh, and again, I, know, I, think, I think I know the case she's referring to, um, facilities uh, must be made available, should be made available. Uh, and if she wants uh, an introduction to Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to facilitate that conversation further, I'd be more than happy to, to make that introduction. Question six, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether there is a need for greater accountability to reduce the risk of people abusing power of attorney status. Minister. Arrangements for powers of attorney are set out in the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act of 2000. The arrangements include protections for those who may be vulnerable, and it is for the grantor to select someone who they trust to act as their attorney. The Office of the Public Guardian has a statutory duty to investigate reported concerns regarding the actions of a financial attorney, and the re relevant local authority has a similar duty in respect of welfare concerns. The Scottish Government has consulted on aspects of the adults with incapacity legislation and we're working on improvements, um, including revision to the current code of practice for attorneys to set out as clearly as possible the rights and responsibilities of attorneys and the safeguards that are in place to protect individuals and the sanctions that can be imposed for misuse. John Mason. I thank the Minister for that answer, but I just feel the safeguards are not very great. I recently took over power of attorney from my mother, and I now have complete access to do whatever I want eh, with her house and all her other eh, financial investments and so on. I don't even have to return an annual report of what I've done with the money. So I do not plan to abuse my mother's eh, money, but eh, I think there is tremendous option to do so. You have all these witnesses now, uh, <laughs> Minister. I'm glad the member has made that clarification of to his intents. 
Um, the arrangements for appointing an attorney are set out in the Adults with Incapacity um, Act to make it clear that it's a private matter for the grantor um, of the parish to consider who it is that they trust to make decisions on their behalf in the future. And as it is a private matter, there's no statutory supervision of the financial attorneys by the Office of the Public Guardian. And the OPG doesn't supervise financial guardians, uh, sorry, does supervise financial guardians. This is a separate process where the applications are made to the Sheriff Court. So if financial concerns are reported to the public guardian, the financial attorney will have to account for their decisions and their actions. Lee MacArthur, briefly, please. Thank you very much. Um, back in 2017, I wrote to the Minister's predecessor about concerns that had been raised with me uh, about the restrictions on who could sign applications for powers of attorney, uh, attorney at that stage. Um, Annabel Ewing confirmed that uh, consultation on, on changes to adults with um, capacity legislation was taking place. Could the Minister um, please uh, commit to write to me with an update of what changes, if any, have been made to the rules around this? Minister. I'm happy to commit to write to the member with an update on that matter. Question 7, James Kelly. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met local authorities in the Scottish Prison Service uh, to get an update on secure unit accommodation. Not quite as drafted, but close. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Scottish Government officials are in regular contact with key organisations involved in the delivery of secure care in Scotland. Officials met local authorities regarding this matter on the 5th of November 2018, the 21st of January 2019 and Social Work Scotland on the 19th of February this year. Uh, there have been no meetings with Scottish Prison Service uh, as they have no involvement in the provision of secure care. Um, we've had no discussions with them uh, on this specific uh, matter. James Kelly. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. The, the latest update states that uh, there are no vacant beds in Scotland's five secure units. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what would happen over the next 48 hours if a young person was remanded and a judge recommended that they be placed in, in a care unit. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say it's my understanding that there is uh, a secure emergency bed available. That does have limitations, though, of course. It's only for short-term use, uh, only normally for 72 hours. But James Kelly is absolutely right uh, to ask this question. It's something that the, the government, uh, Deputy First Minister in particular, has been taking forward uh, after the tragic case of, of William Lindsay uh, Brown, uh, which, he, which he knows about. The, the issue is uh, complex, and I, I know James Kelly will appreciate this, that... Uh, uh, of course, uh, because these uh, secure units are run by independent uh, charities, or most of them are run by independent charities, with the exception of Edinburgh uh, City Council's provision, they have to be kept uh, filled to, to, to approximately 90% capacity. Otherwise, many of those independent charities have said they would not be able to sustain the secure units. We have to find um, a balance between, of course, keeping uh, space available, which is important, uh, and while, of course, uh, uh, making sure that uh, these secure units uh, are sustainable. So uh, I'm expecting an options paper from officials uh, to, to myself and another government uh, minister shortly. Uh, once we have an update to provide, I'll ensure that James Kelly is made aware of that and update. Just squeeze you in. The question eight, Alec Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Do you ask the Scottish Government what the impact on the justice system will be of a new age of criminal responsibility of 12 coming into force? Cabinet Secretary. Raising the age to 12 through the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill will remove children under that age from the criminal justice system. Uh, this means that children under the age of 12 will no longer be arrested or charged, uh, nor will children under 12 be referred to the children's hearing system on offence grounds. However, where children have engaged in serious harmful behaviour, that still needs to be investigated appropriately. So the bill sets out detailed police powers to make clear how and when, and also the boundaries within which police and other agencies in the justice system can act to investigate such incidents. Must be a brief supplementary, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Coming into force as a result of international imperative. Another international imperative is to end the use of police cells for incarceration of children, albeit under the guise of place of safety. Will the minister, will the cabinet secretary, undertake a review of the use of police cells for children, even in terms of place of safety, as it is recognised in adverse childhood experience? Cabinet Secretary, very briefly. Uh, just very briefly, I know my colleague Marie Todd, who leads a course on this bill, has said very publicly uh, that we do not want to see children in police cells. Uh, there may be reasons why that is the only uh, option, but that should be the absolute exception, uh, certainly not the rule. So Marie Todd will continue those discussions in advance of uh, stage three of the bill. Thank you. Move on to questions in government business and constitutional relations. Question one, Duane Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has received any representations from Glasgow City Council seeking addi additional funding in relation to the £92 million of consequentials resulting from EU exit preparation funding. <laughs> 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 
Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, as a responsible government, we are preparing for all EU exit possibilities, and as part of that work, working closely with our partners in local government to help them identify and prepare for the potential impacts of an EU exit. I am aware that Glasgow City Council and other local authorities have expressed concerns about the possible costs of leaving the EU. We have not, as things stand, received any specific requests from Glasgow City Council for additional fundings. That said, COSLA have written to the Scottish Government seeking additional funding for councils to keep, help meet Brexit-related costs, and that request is being considered. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Given the scale of cuts to Glasgow's budgets and the impact on local services and local communities, I have to express some surprise that there has not been more specific demands to, the, to the, the government. But can the Cabinet Secretary clarify and confirm how much of the £54.7 million in EU exit consequentials for 2019-20 will be spent by local government, given the importance of local government in delivering local services? And if you cannot tell me now, will he provide a written response as soon as possible to give local government confidence that they will get funds to address the budget shortfalls that they are experiencing? Minister. Uh, President Officer, the £54.7 million referred to um, has been allocated, allocated across the Scottish budget across all relevant budget areas, including local government. Now, one of the few certainties of Brexit is that it's going to cost Scotland more than the consequentials delivered by Westminster. And of course, local government is one victim of that. Glasgow City Council has, I understand, been undertaking financial modelling to identify the costs of officer time and the need for additional services. And this will inform next steps on their part. The Scottish Government is alive to the burden placed on councils where Brexit Scotland did not vote for and has made clear that we will seek monies from Westminster to meet incurred costs. I hope we would have the support of Joanne Lamont and others on the Labour benches in making the case to the UK Government for a further and appropriate financial settlement from which to address that burden. Question two, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wrote to the Presiding Officer on the 5th of April to set out the Scottish Minister's next steps in giving effect to the decisions this Parliament took when passing the Continuity Bill, decisions that were within the Scottish Parliament's powers to take at that time, but in many cases powers which were retrospectively taken away from this Parliament by an act of the Westminster Parliament. The Scottish Ministers have reluctantly come to the conclusion that given the effect that the EU Withdrawal Act has had on the competence of this Parliament, the best way of giving effect to these decisions is through further legislation tailored to the circumstances of EU exit and to the newly limited powers of this Parliament, rather than by seeking to have the Parliament reconsider the Continuity Bill. As I said in my letter to the Presiding Officer, I am happy to answer questions on this matter here or in any parliamentary setting. Gordon Lindhurst. I thank the Minister for that answer, but after months of rhetoric of threats, big talk and using emergency procedures to rush the bill through, the Scottish Government is now scrapping this Act. Um, surely all along this was no attempt at constructive lawmaking, but just another SNP grandstanding event. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Mr Lindhurst may believe what he wishes, but it's a, a complete travesty of the truth and he should recognise that. The reality of the situation is the bill was lawful uh, when it was passed by this Parliament. Uh, it was the Supreme Court that was very, very clear about that matter. And what happened was the UK Tory government, members of the same party as Mr Lindhurst, so I'm sure he will want to take some responsibility for that, members of the same party then passed legislation to, in actual fact, damage and destroy this bill. That was an anti-democratic action. It was one which he, as an elected member, should speak against but if he is willing to accept anything, even that type of anti-democratic action and, uh, from his own party, then he is not worthy, then he is not worthy of the place he occupies. Annabelle Ewing, briefly. Presiding officer, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm for the avoidance of any doubt that the Scottish Government in its uh, ongoing work will respect to the maximum extent possible the choices made by the Scottish Parliament when it passed the Continuity Bill and that the Scottish Government will introduce new legislation to bring back provisions on keeping pace with EU law? Cabinet Secretary. The keeping pace powers survived even the Tory assault upon the bill. Uh, they are important powers. I think the Parliament will want to look at them again. The choice was clear, and indeed it was a choice that was taken and discussed with all the parties, including the Conservative Party, who were part of those discussions. But the conclusion in the end, and, uh, and I believe it was the right conclusion, was to take the bill into reconsideration, which would be the first time those powers had been used in this Parliament, uh, would have been a risky thing. It would have been a narrow thing. 
we, it's actually quite wise that we look at the keeping pace powers again because we may wish to expand those powers to enable to, us to do some of the things that we otherwise couldn't have done. So I think this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity we will take. And I think it will have the support across the chamber because that was my indication uh, in the cross-party talks. But I'm never sure whether that is going to hold with the Conservatives, but I think it will hold with others. Question three, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the expected timetable for current bills to progress. Minister. Uh, President Officer, legislative planning continues to be un impacted by the unwelcome requirement to develop resources to prepare for a no-deal Brexit. As a consequence, individual bill timetables are subject to continual review. And as Minister for Parliamentary Business, I discuss this with the Parliamentary Bureau and relevant committee conveners on a regular basis. However, I can advise Mr Green that as things stand, the Scottish Government is on course to introduce all of the bills in the current programme for government ahead of the announcement of our next programme. Jamie Green. Uh, the Minister has absolutely no sense of shame in his answer, given the incredible strain that in today's announcement for an independence referendum bill will have on this Parliament. Last year's programme for government announced 12 bills. Minister, how many of those bills will have been published before this Parliament, before summer recess? And how many of them will actually have passed before the end of the session of this Parliament? Minister. Uh, President Officer, sometimes you feel in government you can't win. A few moments ago we were accused of bringing one bill too many. Now we're <laughs> accused of not introducing <laughs> enough bills. Let me yeah. offer the Chamber a, a degree of context and assurance on this issue. In spite of the significant and growing impact of Brexit on the work of government and this Parliament uh, th that we've seen, we anticipate that more bills will achieve royal assent in 2019 than was the case last year. And furthermore, when Parliament returns in September, this administration will have a full programme of fresh and exciting new legislation to announce. That, of course, stands in marked contrast to Westminster, where Mr Green's party is in power, where they have run out of non-Brexit business to consider, yeah. and where it's supported. They are so paralysed by Brexit and ravaged by the divisions it's caused that they are struggling to put together a sufficient programme of bills they can agree on to present in a Queen's speech. Neil Finlay. Uh, <coughs> I uh, can ask the Minister, um, obviously given the, uh, cabinet, uh, the First Minister's statement, um, the government's plans have changed. So therefore, can he explain what will be taken out from the government's plans in order for the First Minister's plans to be put in? Minister. Presiding officer, there are no plans to remove anything from the government's programme uh, of business. We intend to introduce all the bills that we had intended to do previously. Um, and I have every faith in the ability of this parliament to work its way through that programme and see these bills to a conclusion. Question four, Miles Briggs. The Scottish Government, what discussions it has had with the Electoral Commission regarding the provision of a free mail shot for local government election candidates. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has not had any discussion with the Electoral Commission regarding the provision of a free mail shot for local government election candidates in the past five years. Uh, I understand it has been discussed before that. What? Well, I haven't called you yet. <laughs> Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding <laughs> Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and like to put on record our thanks to councillors from all parties and none who serve our communities. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that more consideration should be given to providing a council candidates with a free mail shot during elections as all parliamentary candidates currently receive? And this would help look towards not only recognising the importance of local elections, but help to make sure that we increase the diversity of candidates and those who currently are deterred from standing because of concerns around can, uh, campaign costs. I'd be very willing to discuss this with people if they could bring to the table uh, uh, actual evidence of people being deterred because of campaign leaflet costs. Uh, I think it's much more likely that people are deterred for a range of other reasons, uh, including the uh, salaries that are paid, uh, whether or not they believe that they're going to be able to do an effective job. Um, so I think I would want to see evidence of that brought to the table rather than supposition. If the member has that evidence and wishes to bring that evidence to the table, then I will certainly look at it and discuss it with the Electoral Commission. But I suspect the evidence is about other matters rather than this. Question five, Linda Fabian. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, when it last held discussions with the Prime Minister. Cabinet Secretary. The First Minister and Prime Minister met on the 3rd of April in Downing Street to discuss the UK Government's plans for EU exit. However, the UK government has so far refused to show any willingness to compromise in relation to the single market and retaining freedom of movement, which are essential for Scotland's future. The First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister following the extension of Article 50 until the end of October, 
to call for ongoing talks over EU exit to include the devolved administrations and for any deal agreed by the UK Parliament to be put to a second referendum. The Prime Minister has yet to reply. I raised the same issues in a phone call with David Liddington um, on the day after the decision was made by the European <coughs> Council and I hope to speak to him again this week. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that fulsome answer? And uh, can I suggest that next time anyone from our government meets with the Prime Minister, they ask whether she considers herself a Democrat? And if so, will she recognise the people's right to decide on their constitutional future and the right of Scotland's Parliament to represent its electorate? Would they also ask that she explain to Scotland how a Democrat can deny such rights? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it is a fair and, and accurate point. Uh, I do think it also ignores the... It's funny that when we talk about Scottish democracy, the response to the Tories is to laugh. It always strikes me as significant that that is the case. The Scottish Tories wish to jeer at the concept of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. I think the issue that the Prime Minister and the Scottish Conservative Party need to address is the issue of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. And they need to listen to the Scottish people instead of laughing at them, or in the case of the Prime Minister, contemptuously refusing to listen to them. Question six has been withdrawn. Question seven, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Electoral Commission regarding planning in Scotland for a possible European Parliament elections in May 2019. Cabinet Secretary. Scottish Government officials take part in meetings of the Electoral Commission Advisory Board where planning for the possible European Parliament elections has been discussed. Those meetings are attended by returning officers as well as government officials from all the four UK administrations. Recently, meetings have taken place on a weekly basis. The Scottish Government's clear view is that the European Parliament elections should not be cancelled and should go ahead. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the election will see the election of six Scottish MEPs. Could the Cabinet Secretary perhaps reflect on what Scotland's position would be if they were independent at this election? And does he share my hope that subsequent European Parliament elections Scotland will be take part as an independent member of the European Union. Cabinet Secretary. I, I do uh, hope for that. Uh, I would say to the UK Government that it is a very, very bad look to be involved in cancelling elections. They should look around the globe and see uh, the record of those people, uh, usually in dictatorships, who rejoice in cancelling elections. And they should think of that very, very carefully. There's also a huge cost in organising elections, and that cost, of course, would be wasted. Of course, so much money has been wasted by the UK government on Brexit, it would simply add to that. The experience of Brexit makes the case for independence within the EU even stronger. When you contrast the treatment of Scotland with that of independent nations, then it is very clear. But also the contrast is absolutely clear in representation in the European Parliament. The Republic of Ireland, a uh, comparable population in Scotland, has 11 MEPs. Denmark has 13, as done Finland, uh, does Finland. Scotland currently has an allocation of six MEPs as part of the UK's total of 73 MEPs. We are being forced to the sidelines and to the margins. Independence would allow us to protect our place in Europe, conduct our relationships with the rest of the UK and the EU on the basis of equality. Question eight, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it anticipates Brexit having on the supply of skilled labour. Minister. President Officer, the Scottish Government published No Deal Brexit economic implications for Scotland on the 21st of February, which demonstrated clearly that Brexit would be catastrophic for jobs and investment across Scotland. Brexit creates risks around the confidence and competitiveness of our businesses, their ability to plan and invest with certainty, and potentially drastic increases in unemployment levels. Uh, when combined, these issues will cause significant disruption to the supply of skills to businesses in this country. That's why we're working with a range of partners, including Skills Development Scotland, to understand the potential impact of Brexit in regions and sectors. Uh, we're preparing to respond as fully as possible to any resulting skill shortages and gaps, building on the strengths of our current skill system should the UK government decide to see through its plans for Brexit. But as Mr Gibson will recognise, you cannot fully mitigate the unmitigatable. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive reply and for the first time ever heard the word unmitigatable. Um, does he agree that the labour supply will be disproportionately impacted in key sectors of the economy where EU nationals form a significant part of the workforce? And can I outline what sectors are most likely to be adversely affected and what the effect will be on economic growth as a result? 
Minister? President, officer, there are clearly a number of key sectors which will be particularly affected. Agriculture, hospitality, care services and the NHS, for example, all stand to be particularly adversely hit. And if we consider the role of agriculture and the massive success story that food and drink is for Scotland, it becomes self-evident how damaging Brexit will be in that key growth area. By way of a specific detailed illustration, my own constituency is home to a soft fruit industry turning over around £50 million annually. It requires access to more than 4,000 seasonal migrant workers to pick and pack its product, a workforce that is already finding difficulty accessing, and that's before Brexit kicks in. President officer, Mr Gibson is absolutely right to highlight the threat posed to the Scottish economy by Brexit. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. And can I say that I see some members in the next debate are not present. Now, remember, business is a follow-on. And if we gain time in one session, it means that we have more time for the debate. So I'm going to just start the next debate, notwithstanding all members are not present in the chamber. Um,